Oh, it's all good. Let's start over. Thank you, Audrey, for getting us prepared for worship. Technology is a wonderful thing when it works. Welcome to Trinity United Methodist Church, 11 o'clock traditional service. We welcome you watching online. We so hope you can't be here with us, but we know that we are keeping everyone safe through this thing we call COVID-19, and we wish you a safe and healthy day and week as we get closer and closer to Christmas. We hope that you have gotten the email that came out on Friday that talked about um, all of the wonderful things happening here at Trinity, even as during the closure. Um, there's some wonderful opportunities for service in our church, and we hope you'll take advantage of each and every one of those. At this time, please join me in the greeting that was emailed to you on Friday. <clears throat> Sing and rejoice, O daughter Zion. Many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day.
God promised to send a Savior for the people. Today we read from the Gospel of Luke in the scripture, Jesus very time to pray and heal. There must have been times when Mary was frightened, worried, fearful, and sad. But we have these words of joy even at a time when she was unsure of the future. Her words can guide us to look to the joy of God even when things may be uncertain for us. Listen to this to these words from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 47 to 55. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Please pray with us. Dear God, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for the joy remembering Jesus' birth brings to us today. Help us live in such a way that our words and our actions help others know of the joy you give. Good morning, Trinity. Children, if you come closer to the TV or the screen, computer. Um, often we do things without knowing why we do them. It's just a tradition, so I wanted to find out some more. And I'm going to share that with you today <clears throat> on Advent, in the Advent wreath specifically. Advent is from the Latin word Adventus, meaning coming. It was first used in 1800 by a Lutheran minister in Germany. And it was to help the children understand the coming of Jesus. And each Sunday of Advent, which there's four Sundays, we light one of the candles. Each of the candles has a symbol and a name. So the very first candle, I don't know if I turn it the right direction here. There we go. The very first candle is hope. And it is called the prophet candle because the prophets, um, announced the Messiah's arrival, and it was a hope for um, the future. Purple or blue is the color that symbolizes royalty. The second candle is love, as Miss Moni has said. Uh, and the, it's called the Bethlehem, Bethlehem candle because it foretold of the Messiah and where he was to be born. And the purple or blue is for preparation. 
The third candle is the joy candle. This one right here. And it is called the shepherd's candle because Jesus came um, for humble, unimportant individuals as the shepherds as they saw themselves. And it is rose, red, or pink for joyfulness. The fourth candle is of peace, and it's known as the angel candle. The angels announced that Jesus came to bring peace and to bring them clo- people close to God. Again, it is blue or purple for the culmination of love through Jesus. And the very last candle, the fifth candle, the Christ candle, is lit on Christmas Day. And it is white to light to represent light and purity and the victory over darkness. We also have on the wreath, you have evergreen, which shows everlasting life, life, and the circle is God's unending love. There's pine cones that you can put on there, and that shows rebirth, and the holly berries show and represent Jesus' sacrifice for us. So if we can bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your everlasting and eternal love for the birth and sacrifice of your Son, and for his light to show us the way through the darkness of the world. Please help us to be patient and take time to enjoy the waiting during this season of celebration. In your Son's holy name we pray. Amen.
is the third Sunday of Advent, and um, we're in the season of hope and love, and today is joy. Um, the other day I watched the Charlie Brown Christmas. I love that show. Now, you know I'm a Rudolph guy, but um, I love also watching the Charlie Brown Christmas. And you got to feel for Charlie Brown, don't you? I mean, poor Charlie Brown. He does the best that he can, and he just, he just can't catch a break. So this, this um, show is exactly the same. Right? He, he, he's down. He just doesn't have the Christmas spirit. But, but Lucy says, why don't you be the director of the play, the, the, the school play that the children are going to be a part of? And he says, well, sure. And we understand that because we all want to do our own thing. Well, Charlie Brown couldn't get the, the kids together well. And he gets frustrated and he figures out, okay, we've got to have some decorations. We gotta have something to liven up, like our sanctuary. We have it decorated with the Christmas tree and the poinsettias and everything, the Advent wreath. It's all beautiful. So he goes out and he's looking, looking at our Christmas tree. And what does he find? You know, he finds what is famously called the Charlie Brown Christmas tree—a little tiny tree that really looks pretty pitiful. That is kind of sitting amongst all the other trees. Well, when he gets there, that's the one that he wants. And so he gives it and he brings it back to decorate the, the stage and the set. And all the kids laugh at him. Right. Charlie Brown, you can't do anything right. Um, early on in the show, he's called the Charlie Browniest of the Charlie Browns. He is like, man, he just struggles with life. So he takes his tree and he goes. But all the children follow him. And they follow him, and he, he puts the tree down, and uh, he ends up leaving, and the tree is left near Snoopy's doghouse. And, of course, Snoopy's doghouse won first place because of all the decorations on it. And all the other kids take some of those decorations, they put it on this little tree, and it becomes a nice Christmas tree, full of light, full of greenery. Charlie Brown comes back in and realizes that what has happened and they come to realize what the real, true meaning of Christmas is all about. Charlie Brown was a witness to Christmas. He didn't feel like he had the Christmas spirit, but he really did have the Christmas spirit because he didn't go for the, the tree that was big and bold, but he went for the little one, and out of something small and tiny and, and fraggly became something great. Right? And so Charlie Brown at the end, they're all singing, and everybody's happy, and they have the, the Christmas spirit. We're talking about witnesses and interrogators, two different words, witnesses and interrogators. Charlie Brown was ended up being a witness, and he didn't even know it. He, he didn't even realize that he was being this witness. And how many times do we think we are a witness or not? Witnesses and interrogators. Those are legal terms a lot of times we think about, right? So an interrogator, you, 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 you have possibly committed a crime, you have some information, whatever it is, someone asks you questions. Who, what, where, when, why, how? They ask you the questions and they want an answer or response of some kind. A witness, on the other hand, is someone who might be able to provide some information to help someone else, possibly. I witnessed this happening and this person did, didn't, X, Y, Z happen. They point to something else. When an interrogator comes and asks you a question or someone a question, and it's directed just at you or that person. But a witness is someone who points to something else. And however that flows, it goes. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8 and 19 through 28 are our scripture today. Let's hear these words, and I'm going to tie in witnesses and interrogators. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He said, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? 
John said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, today's Gospel lesson, I think, gives us the truth. It suggests two ways that we can approach life and God's kingdom and His presence in the world, Emmanuel. One way is demonstrated by John. He is a witness. He is not the Messiah, but he points to one that is coming. The other way is demonstrated by the priests and the Levites. We are either witnesses or we are interrogators. John was a witness sent by God. The priests and the Levites were interrogators. They were sent by the religious authorities. Who are you? Are you Elijah? Why are you baptizing? Over and over and over asking him a thousand questions. John, on the other hand, is one who points to the light, to the Messiah. And the other religious authorities have no clue who this person really is. But John knows who he is and who he is not. He claims for himself neither too much or too little. It makes him a credible witness. He speaks the truth, but he is not the truth. He is illumined by the light, but he is not the light. He is the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, but he is not the Word of God. Everything about John points to the light and the life in which he lived, who both stands among us and the one who is coming, right? So we talk about Emmanuel, God with us, right? We point to Emmanuel. We point to one who stands with us and is among us and is also not among us. John will bet his life on that one, and I pray that we bet our life on that one too. That's how it is with a witness. They live and die based on what they have seen, heard, and experienced. So here's the real difference between a witness and an interrogator. You might want to write this down, think about this. So an interrogator demands answers. A witness offers hope. So I'll repeat that. Interrogators demand answers, whereas a witness offers hope. So we're in the season of, of Advent, right? and it's easy to get wrapped up in all the, the pieces that are going on with buying gifts and wrapping gifts and planning visits or not planning visits and quarantining and not quarantining and going here and there and all over the place. We can't, we can't comprehend all that's going on. We just go through it. No wonder people are up. Uh, depressed and anxiety is high during this season because the level of activity, everything is just elevated. It is, it is difficult. But we need a witness of hope in this world today. One way that I believe that it's happening, and we at Trinity are doing that, and I believe that Trinity will be a witness moving into the, the new year and not an interrogator. We don't need to interrogate and asking a thousand questions pointed at someone, but we need to show and point to the one who will help us understand and give us the answers that we need. So what we're doing now is, I think Trinity is a great example of that. Right? We are a witness as a church. We have names, we get gifts, we wrap them, we bring them to the church. They're being given to the family. We don't interrogate the family. Why don't you have anything? Why do you live in those apartments? What kind of food? Why don't you have food in your cupboard? We're not asking those questions of them. We're not judging or pointing but we're wrapping, we're giving, we're praying for them, saying Merry Christmas, God bless. We are a witness, right? So families who receive these gifts are receiving a gift from someone they don't even know. And we're giving something for someone that we don't even know. A witness. We're pointing to something greater. Not ourselves, but to God. More than ever, our world needs hope. And I think that's an obvious question. It is our obvious answer, right? It, it is just unbelievably hard to, to walk out, to, to turn on your computer, to television, newspaper, just listen to your neighbors, right? It's unbelievably hard. That's why I think that if you can get one of those 
Hashtag love your neighbor sign. Put it out there to let people know that you love your neighbor, right? You don't have to have a sign to love your neighbor. But sometimes it's good to be reminded of. Other people see that about us. It's a way that we can point to the one. John is the voice of hope. His words echo through the wildernesses of our world and our lives. Remember last week I said John was a crazy man, right? He was crazy out of the wilderness. He was dressed crazy. He had long hair, beard, and, you know, ate out of the ground. But yet, he pointed to something that was greater and better and unbelievably more sure and certain than anything that any of us can even imagine. But John wasn't the first voice of hope, right? Before John, there was Mary proclaiming the greatness of the Lord. She spoke of the one who shows favor to the lowly, offers mercy, and lends the strength of his arm. He fills the hungry with good things and comes to help of his people. That sounds like trimetry to me. Before Mary, there was Isaiah. Right? The Lord anointed him to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. He spoke about God who was comforting those who mourn and rebuilding the ruins of their lives. They will be clothed in garments of salvation and wear robes of righteousness. Wow, I mean, that is what we're talking about, who we're pointing to. Now, John and Mary and Isaiah, each one is a witness and a witness of hope. They look at the circumstances of their life and the world, and they see a greater reality. They each testify to a life and a presence beyond their own. Within each of their voice is the Word that was in the beginning, the Word that was with God, and the Word that is God, and the Word that became flesh and dwelled among us. Everything that needs to be said was spoken in that one Word. That Word is our ultimate hope. Think about the tragedies, the difficulties in your life, the death of a loved one, an illness, an addiction, Divorce, guilt, the sin that separates us from God, others, and our own selves. Answers and explanations did not sustain you, and they won't sustain you or me. How, when, what, or why was not what you needed to hear. It was the word of hope that got you through that. If people intend well when they give advice in the midst of a tragedy, depression, activity, whatever it is you might go through. We all want to help, but sometimes the who, what, where, when, why, and how is not what we want to hear. We just desire some sense of hope. So here's another phrase to remember. Hope doesn't make life easy. It makes life possible. I'll say that again. Hope doesn't make life easy. It makes life possible. And you already know that's true because you're watching and you're already living today. Because all of us have been through hopeless situations. We have all felt hopeless at some point. We have all struggled through whatever it is that we're going through. Yet, however, we have made it through. Hope reminds us that it won't always be like this. There's light. And there's life that comes to us. It's already here among us. The interrogators of the world, however, make it difficult to hear that other voice, the witness of hope. These interrogators clamor and compete for our attention. They often speak the loudest, but the voice of hope is never silent. Which voice do you listen to? Which voice do you follow? Those are questions we must answer every day. And they're challenging Questions and answers, because sometimes the interrogators are the ones that we follow. Most of the times they are. Believing that there is hope at the end of that yellow brick road. There might be a wizard at the other end of that ro road, but that's not who we want at the other end of the road. We don't want the wizard, but we want the Lord. And that's who we need to be waiting at the other end. And not only waiting at the other end, but we don't need the, the lion, the scarecrow, and the tin man when we have Emmanuel who walks with us. So which voice do we listen to? The reality of humanity is that we are people of the wilderness. We are like John. The reality of God is that God is the God of hope. Do we trust the voice of the wilderness? 
Or do we trust the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness? Do we trust humans? Or do we trust God? Do we trust, okay, I'm part of the United Methodist Church? Or are we disciples of Christ? What are we going to do? All have an importance. But what's the most important? I think I'm listening to the one who's crying out in the wilderness. The voice we listen to is the voice with which we will speak. So if we're listening to a voice, we typically will speak that voice. So if we are in a sense of where we are not where we should be, and we're listening to that voice, our language, our actions will sound like that. But if we're in a posture of prayer and hope and in Scripture and with God, then our voice will sound like that. Hope is not easy. We must practice hope. It means we rejoice always. We pray without ceasing. We give thanks in all circumstances. Friends, we have to practice it. Is it going to be hard? Yes. Are we going to get hurt? Absolutely. Are people going to die around us? Most certainly. Are we going to get bloodied up ourselves? Maybe. Are we going to make it through it? Absolutely. 100%. Interrogators will look at and they'll question the circumstances of our rejoicing and praying and giving thanks. Think back to Charlie Brown and his little tree. And all the children around them laughed at Charlie Brown because of his little tree. They couldn't believe that Charlie Brown just was just a bonehead. He just didn't get it. But who had the last word? Because in the end, they realized what Charlie Brown had done was show them what the true meaning of hope and the season is all about. And they began to rejoice and give thanks and sing. Are the circumstances right for rejoicing and praying and giving thanks right now for you? They should be, even if it might be difficult. Is there a reason for those things? Yes. There are reasons to rejoice and to pray and to give thanks. Interrogators want answers. They want justifications and reasons. They want to be like the Grinch who looks at the Whoville and Cindy Lou Who, right? And say, why are they singing and laughing and I'm going to take everything from them, even the roast beef? And what happens? They continue to sing. They don't give up. So why are we giving up when it gets hard? Why are we giving up when we say we don't have? Why are we frustrated when we say, man, we're not like, Mm -mm." we need to rejoice always and pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances. Witnesses like ourselves look beyond the circumstances to the God who fills those circumstances. I don't stand here on my own. You don't sit where you are or wherever you are on your own. It's because God is with you. And speaks through us and beyond us. He fills us with hope and love and peace and joy. It, It opens our eyes to see who is coming prepares our heart to welcome the one who is already among us. And for those who don't know, it allows us to, to share. Make straight the way of the Lord. Hope is not a feeling. Hope is not a feeling, but it is an orientation and an attitude of our own life. We have to practice it. Hope doesn't come naturally. It's not something that we, we it's not a feeling, right? We have to orient ourselves for hope. So that's the voice we need to listen to, not the voice of the interrogator. Hope allows us to recognize and know the Christ who's already here and not yet here. Hope doesn't change the circumstances of our life. It changes us, and that changes everything. Let me say that again. Hope doesn't change the circumstances of our life, but it changes us, and that changes everything. You can't go back to the beginning of the story and start again. Create a new beginning. But you can go forward and create a new ending. And that starts now. You can look back, but don't, don't glance too far. 
and too long. Look forward and say, the ending is going to be different from where I started. And that gives us the hope that we're seeking. So my prayer this week is that we will be a witness. How can we be a witness? How can Trinity be a witness instead of an interrogator? We, it's good to ask questions, but that's not what this is about. You can ask those questions, but when they're pointed at someone to try to get something out of somebody, then we might be missing the point. And instead of looking at them and judging, we might just say, here's the light of the world, or there it is, or over here, and we point to it, and not allow ourselves to get wrapped up and have the light on us, but to reflect the light of the light of the world, Jesus the Christ. Let us pray. Oh, good and gracious God, we are thankful for this day and this opportunity that we gather together. We are so thankful for the ways that you bless us and bless our world. You've touched us in ways that are unbelievable. You have reached deep inside of us and have made us the people that we are. Oh God, we're so thankful that we can gather together, even though we're not together. That we can hear your word proclaimed, even though we are miles apart. That we can not only hear, but feel your presence, even though we don't reside in the same building. For we know, oh God, your church isn't the building. It is us. Your children. The people. And we ourselves have an opportunity to be this sense of hope. For that, oh God, we give you great thanks. We're thankful for the opportunities that you bestow upon us. And we're mindful of that. Oh God, we thank you for this day and this opportunity that we gather together. Does it go unnoticed that there are those who are hungry? There are those who are have no place to sleep at night, no shelter out of the elements. We're mindful of those that can't find hope. They don't know where hope is. They've not heard the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. God, you can instill in us, you can lead us, you can show us, you can put folks in front of us so that we ourselves might have that opportunity. We ourselves can be the hope of the world. But not us. We point to that one. People may see that in us and say that it is us, but we have to always be mindful to say, no, I'm not he, but this is who he is, and this is what he's done for me. This is why I stand in front of him. Oh God, we've been made a blessing to others, and we never know the words we say and the ways that we interact with folks, how that has changed the, the direction of someone's life. The people that we come across, those that are watching or listening, who knows how the words that I have spoken today, the music that Resound has played, the voices of those who have sung, the, the, the piano that is played by Audrey, no telling what God will do through that. And we don't have to be the interrogator and ask that question. We just need to keep pointing, singing, speaking, playing, doing, and living. It is quite simple, but it is challenging. We don't want to be hurt. We don't want to be burned by the fire. We don't want to get our knees skinned up. We know that it will be hard. We want to get more rest. We don't want to stay up and do all these things. We don't want to go into these neighborhoods. We don't want to, we want to be safe. We don't want to do these things. We just, we just get, we miss the point, God. We put ourselves in the center. But if you're calling us to go, then we'll go. If you're calling us to stay, then we'll stay. But you're calling us. And whatever the calling, we need to be faithful. 
Oh God, we thank you for this day and this opportunity that we gather together, that we're able to to hear, and some are able to see. We miss being with one another, and then there's a challenge. But we're still worshiping. God's word is still proclaimed, and Jesus is still light of the world. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Come, all you who are faithful. Come, all you who are, who, are, who are in need, who are thirsty and hungry. Come and be faithful and go into the world. The opportunity that we have before us right now. We can be witnesses to the light of hope. We have the opportunity right now never to have to worry about what happened yesterday, but knowing that right now, this moment, moving forward, we can point to the one who is Christ the Lord. Go in peace to love and serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this day and always. Amen.